This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and I live and work out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. But back in 2016, I decided I wanted to extend the walls of my practice and produce a podcast, which is, of course, Self Work. I want to reach those of you who are already quite interested in psychological or emotional issues, but would love to hear another perspective. I also want to reach out to those of you who might just have been diagnosed with depression or anxiety. You're having some kind of relationship problem that you can't seem to solve. But I also want to reach out to those of you who might never darken the door of a therapist, or that's what you say, but are just curious enough or actually desperate enough to reach out for some answers. Welcome to all of you. There's so many times when I don't think things are going to go well or I predict such And boy, I wish I was wrong. And sometimes, believe me, I am wrong. But I wrote a post back in 2015, right after a young Josh Duggar's problems with sexual abuse came to be known. His family, rooted in a very conservative faith system, didn't send him to appropriate treatment. You can read about it in my article, which is in the show notes. They could have well afforded that kind of treatment, but maybe it didn't fit with their belief system. They've had several different responses. Now he's been charged with alleged internet child porn practices, and he has six of his own children with another on the way. Again, I'm sorry I was right, but I'm not surprised. So today I'm going to focus on sexual addiction in this episode sponsored once again by Athletic Greens. You may not believe sex addiction is actually real, but from my experience, I believe it's very real and very destructive. We're, of course, always going to talk about what you can do about it. The listener email for today is from someone whose girlfriend suffers from depression and with whom he was deeply in love, and she suddenly, and to him inexplicably, broke up with him. He's asking for some kind of information or understanding as he tries to face what has happened. So welcome to this edition of Self Work, our 230th actually, going to be talking about the very complex issue of sexual addiction. Years ago, I saw a woman, let's call her Nan, who'd been married for many years. She'd found out that her husband, we'll call him Jay, had slept with another woman while he was in the army, as well as on their honeymoon. He'd also confessed that around once a month, he hired prostitutes and drove to other towns for their services. She was angry for many reasons, but especially because he severely criticized her as being one of the main reasons for his actions. Now, you may be forming an opinion of Jay as a really bad guy, or certainly one without integrity, but there's another part of the story. He hated his behavior and himself for not being able to stop. Sometimes he explained the woman just listened to him or held him, and it really wasn't even involving sex. His own parents had basically neglected him. He'd suffered major depression for years and constantly wanted to kill himself and had attempted several times. The severity of his depression finally required several rounds of ECT, or electroconvulsive therapy, shock therapy, which is mostly available to those who are failing other kinds of treatment. He said it hadn't really helped. The couple had children, and he'd been a pretty good dad. He held a position in the community of authority and was very respected. It was much to my surprise, actually, that he'd come into therapy, but he explained that he'd gone to therapist after therapist with no success. He was often short with me. I could understand that he was defensive and didn't want to be labeled as the bad guy, which I tried very hard not to do. I often see this when people have had affairs. They're leery of therapy being about labeling them as bad. But when I asked him one question, his answer shocked me. I asked who else he told about his sexual behavior, and he said, no one asked. I was flabbergasted. No one asked? Gently, I said to him, You've wanted to die for years, and you've carried this intense shame around with you, and your shame could very well be at the crux of you believing that death would be preferable to life, and yet 
you've never talked to anybody about this. I wish I could say that things in therapy went better. At first, he seemed to understand and was willing to hear more. So many people don't talk about these kinds of addictions because of fear of being shamed, and he felt enough of that already. So I explained that I believed he had a sexual addiction with many reasons for needing that kind of escape. I talked about several treatment programs in the U.S. and found one that would literally get him started with one week of intensive treatment, as he stated that he was too busy for actual residential treatment. I gave them both materials on Dr. Patrick Karn's work, the man who is largely the reason why sexual addiction is being recognized by so many, as well as explaining that there are therapists who go through extensive training to be able to treat sex addiction and its many complexities, and I knew of several in our area of the country. He nodded in what I hoped was relief. She looked more relaxed, as I said that CSATs, as what they're called, Certified Sexual Addiction Therapists, CSATs, were also trained in working with spouses of a sexual addict. But it didn't go as I'd hoped. He never came back. She came in one more time, angry with me. She said she believed I was only focusing on the bad in their relationship and not all the good that was there. And I never saw them again. Let me quickly say that I'm not a CSAT. But you can't be a therapist for years without running into addictions, gambling, substances, work, love, spending, and certainly sex. I've seen both women and men who've come in with sexual addiction, and if the addiction was severe, I referred them to a CSAT. But if it wasn't severe, and their already established trust in me, and perhaps even practical measures, were part of their decision to stick with me, I did my best. And several got much better after they'd worked through the shame of talking about it. The memory of Jay and Nan has made me sad for years. I don't know what happened, but I wish them well so many times. Both were lost, and both were trying to live their lives and even save their lives. The recent reporting of Josh Duggar being arrested on alleged childhood porn charges brought all of this up again for me. I wrote an article about him and his family years ago. He's an Arkansas man when he was first accused of sexually assaulting five young teenage girls. But the statute of limitations had run out. At the time, he stated, 12 years ago, as a young teenager, I acted inexcusably, for which I'm extremely sorry and deeply regret. He was 27 at the time and posted this on the Duggar family's Facebook page. I hurt others, including my family and close friends. I confessed this to my parents, who took several steps to help me address the situation. So the public was watching. At the time, his family had a very popular television show, at least popular for a certain audience. But the law said they could do nothing. My own article was written out of concern for his victims and for him. This was something that was wrong, that if ignored, was likely to get worse. But the opportunity was missed. His family was highly conservative religiously, Yet instead of modeling for their followers that he needed appropriate treatment as well as the girls, they stuck him away somewhere. Literally, I think some kind of family friend who might have been a pastoral counselor of some kind. He's now allegedly accused of internet child porn activities, which if found guilty could land him in prison for over 20 years. And maybe he could have gotten real help. That's my focus. Maybe he could have gotten help before more chaos was created. Maybe there wouldn't have been other victims. Calling it a bad mistake simply wasn't and isn't enough. And part of an addictive personality is not taking responsibility for the impact of your actions on others. So let's talk about sexual addiction. What exactly is it? The World Health Organization calls it a type of impulse control disorder characterized by a persisting pattern of failed attempts to control sexual impulses or urges, resulting in repetitive sexual behaviors lasting over an extended period of time. Possible symptoms include, but are not limited to, preoccupation with sexual activities to the detriment of personal health, interests, and responsibilities, numerous failed attempts to reduce sexual behaviors, and continued engagement in sexual activities despite harmful impact or negative consequences to self and or others. Again, very similar to other diagnostic criteria for addictions, although they call it a compulsive sexual behavior disorder, or CSBD. 
It's important to note that the distress characterized by the disorder cannot be solely based on a person's moral beliefs or judgment about sexual impulses, urges, or behaviors. Now, I've mentioned Dr. Patrick Carnes before. In 2001, he opened the door to our culture, understanding sexual addiction is a real problem, not just people messing around or being immoral or having a bunch of affairs. And he talked about sexual addiction in the same way we talk about other addictions. And he described the addiction cycle, which has four phases. The first one is preoccupation. The second one, ritualization. The third, compulsive sexual behavior. Compulsive meaning you can't help it. You are compelled. And the fourth is despair. Preoccupation is the mental state that fuels an obsessive search for sex. Then you develop ritualistic or patterned behavior that leads up to the sexual behavior, which makes it very difficult to control or stop the activity. And then comes the despair, not only about their behavior, but about them feeling powerless over it. Remember Jay, who wanted to stop the behavior, but he couldn't. I'm going to give you a really good example of just this cycle, but first, a message from Athletic Greens and an offer from them and me. I've used this now for three months, and I know I'm creating a much healthier space for myself. So is my husband. And as a 66-year-old woman who's doing her best to stay fit and healthy, it's been absolutely wonderful. When Athletic Greens reached out to me, I of course said I'd need to try the product, and I was actually shocked. It tastes great with cold water, And I felt more focused. I've had better digestion and energy. Even my non-health conscious husband is loving it. Let me give you some facts. They call it a life-changing nutritional habit. To me, it's like giving yourself a gift every morning. It contains 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, including probiotics and something called adaptogens. It fits all kinds of diets and has less than one gram of sugar. And it's easy. One scoop in the morning, and you can do away with so many of those other expensive supplements that you swallow every night. And because I said a fervent yes to their sponsorship, you can visit athleticgreens.com slash selfwork, and along with the product, you'll receive a free year supply of vitamin D3, and most of us are deficient, and K2 in one tiny drop, as well as five convenient travel packs. Again, go to athleticgreens.com slash selfwork and experience it yourself. You know, I always focus on what you can do about it, and Athletic Greens fits the bill. So I promised an example. I worked with a woman quite a bit ago. She'd been focused on letting go of her daughter as there was some enmeshment there, and she was right in the middle of empty nest and learning to put energy into her own life. She was obese, and there was also some chronic conflict with this same daughter. But with therapy, she began to enjoy their relationship once more. She backed off. She made some inroads in her management of food. And actually, she said she was much happier and she had a better relationship with her husband after therapy. But just last year, I got a call from this same woman. She came in sobbing and said there was something she'd never told me. And for the first time that she had considered suicide. She began revealing a sexual addiction, looking at porn when home alone. It had moved through these exact same states. At first, she was just kind of curious about it. Then it became almost habitual, something she did every afternoon around the same time. Then, because of shame and secrecy and a felt need for more, it followed the rest of the pattern. After she told me about it, she said she was just consumed with fear that it would be found out. We talked about her telling her husband. He'd always been very supportive, and so she did that. And in revealing the secret, she was able to stop the behavior. But then we looked at all kinds of issues in her past that had led her there, and we were able to focus even more on what would bring her true joy. According to Carnes, 17% of sex addicts have actually attempted suicide. 72% have thought about it. As he says, to preserve their integrity, Dr. Jekyll has to kill Mr. Hyde. There are two other ways to consider sexual addiction. First, as a brain disease in which the brain is fundamentally altered and rewires itself so that the individual makes recurrent bad choices or destructive choices around food, sex, money, alcohol, drugs. But research also shows that sexual addiction is an intimacy disorder, meaning if you have secure attachments 
as a child, your parents provided safety and security, you're far less apt to develop an addiction. As an anonymous writer for the Irish Times writes, often grandiose on the outside, further masking your inner lack of self-worth, you might even be charming and very appealing to others, but there is no real intimacy in your life. Exposing yourself to this amount of vulnerability would be unthinkable. And then there's a third component. So there's brain disease or brain change, intimacy disorder, but third, the role of the internet. This was huge for the woman I talked about a few minutes ago. Again, we'll quote Pat Carnes. We understand now that the internet allows visual and auditory stimulation in intense and rapid sequences, and the variety of sexually stimulating material is limitless. In the neuroplasticity of things, meaning the way your brain changes, there's another phenomenon we call imprinting. When I went to school, I was told that your sexuality is pretty well defined between the ages of 5 and 11. But arousal that is experienced on the internet teaches the brain that in order for arousal to really work, to get that ideal level of stimulation, novelty has to be a part of it. It needs to be something new or different. And that means two things. First, the arousal template is changed. And arousal becomes a constant quest for something you haven't done before, something new and better. In fact, it's also true that people who engage in internet porn find it much more difficult to be aroused and for a man to have an erection with their partner. It's not new. It's not that stimulating. So you can see how complicated it becomes. But I also want to stress that there are things you can do about it. And I'm going to use Karn's model. It's very difficult work. He says you're confronting your demons. And again, this is for more severe addictions. But any addiction, you have to face your shame. You have to look at triggers. You have to look at everything. And then you have to allow yourself to turn what has been ugly in your life into something meaningful and that can give you hope. Now, Karn says treatment takes three to five years. Again, this is for severe addiction. You must work with CSAT. He suggests participation in a 12-step meeting. You have to work the steps so you get your conscience back. You involve the family in treatment and how the family is part of the problem because of usual codependency. You get in touch with spirituality and you attend to personal health care. Again, that's change on every level and that is not easy at all. But I have referred people who have severe sexual addictions to these kinds of programs and to CSATs, and I promise you, it can work with enough work on your part. The listener email today is from a man whose heart is broken. He'd been dating someone with depression, and she suddenly broke up with him. What would you tell him? Let's listen. Hello, Dr. Lutherford. So, about two weeks ago, my girlfriend broke up with me. Um, she suffers from depression. Um, she had told me before, but we had never dealt with it. Uh, we might not have been together with uh, for a long time. It was only three months, but everything was perfect. Everything seemed to be going really well. Um, I made her really happy. She made me really happy. But then from one day to another, everything changed. She went one day from saying, I miss you, to the other day, <laughs> basically breaking up with me. Um, and this whole situation has left me very confused. I don't understand how feelings change that dramatically from one day to another. Um, I also don't never dealt with anybody that has things depression like that, but I've dealt with anxiety, so I know that mental health is very, very important and can get take over really fast. I'm very confused. I would like some help and maybe try to get some clarity or someone else's perspective on it. Um, it's been really tough for the last two weeks. I've seeked going back to therapy. Uh, but I don't think it's maybe the best thing to do. Maybe I'm just rushing into it because I'm hurting too much. I really hope uh, you have some kind words for me or just, you know, help me out with clarification. Um, I really hope to hear from you. Thank you. Have a good day. Here are some of my thoughts. Depression certainly can involve a need for isolation or the tendency to isolate and feeling overwhelmed by too much commitment to be present. Being in love can be an intense experience, and if you struggle with episodes of depression, then you might have to fight off needs to seclude yourself, especially if your depression is part of a cycle where you have times when you feel quite energetic or able to be connected, and then other times when you don't. But people say they have depression, and it can mean many things. Maybe you're in a depressed episode now. Maybe you have recurrent depression. So just saying, I deal with depression is pretty vague. 
to break up with someone rather than saying something like, I'm having a hard time right now and need some space. That kind of gets my attention about this young woman. Perhaps she doesn't know how to say that. She's a people pleaser or not accustomed to setting boundaries when she needs to. Who knows? But also, she could actually have intimacy problems. Perhaps she really wants to be close to someone, allowing herself to fall in love. But when the relationship becomes too close, she's apt to become insecure or even avoid it. Again, we touched on this in talking about sexual addiction. These are known as attachment issues that occur when you didn't have a secure attachment to your parents, meaning they didn't provide safety for you. So at your core, when you try to connect with others, you can be very insecure and even needy for affirmation, or perhaps like this woman, you try on being close, but then you get scared and you avoid it. I can certainly hear this man's hurt and surprise, because by all standards, things seem to be going well. But my guess is that she's struggling with some kind of secret of her own that she hasn't yet shared. She backed off and even broke up with him because of those dynamics. Of course, there are other possible explanations. Some people are addicted to falling in love but then get bored. It could be a myriad of things. My advice to this young man is you may never know the answer, so you have to get your own emotional closure. And that can be hard, but it's possible. So good luck to you. I want to thank all of you for being here at Self Work. I've recently received lots of ratings for Perfectly Hidden Depression on Amazon. They just keep going up, and that means so much to me. That means there's someone reading it and letting others know that it's either really good, really bad, which luckily there have not been very many of those, in fact, hardly at all. And it means a lot to me that you're letting other people know about what the message of the book, A Perfectly Hidden Depression, means to you. That a perfect looking life, a controlled life, a happy life, an apparently successful life, it can mask something going on underneath that's really very dangerous. So if this applies to you, perhaps the exercises in the book Perfectly Hidden Depression might be helpful to you. It's available in audiobook, ebook, or paperback. And again, thank you to those who are leaving ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Thank you so very much. I read them, I smile. I often hear, I stumbled upon this podcast, which I think maybe I need more marketing, (laughs) but I'm glad you stumbled on the self-work. There are lots of ways you can reach out to me. Please feel free to email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I answer as many of those as I can, but sometimes I can't answer all of them. You can also leave me a message on SpeakPipe, which is the way this young man did today. And I love hearing the inflections in your voice and you asking the questions yourself That's available in the show notes as well as on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com. Speaking of that, you can subscribe at drmargaretrutherford.com and you'll get a weekly newsletter that includes my weekly blog post, my podcast, any other news, maybe seminars where I'm speaking or something else that I think just might interest you. But that's it, one weekly newsletter, I promise. I also have a Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. And I'm pretty active over on Instagram, so I would love to have you there or on Pinterest. So thank you so much for being here. Take very, very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.